Uh, hi, everybody. We welcome you to the last day uh, of the online conference, Philosophy and Generative Grammar. Um, in case you don't have the conference program, you can find it in the link, link that I'm posting uh, right now uh, in the chat. Uh, that, be, that being said, um, it is my pleasure to introduce the, uh, today's first speaker, David Lindemann from Georgetown University. The talk he's given today is titled In Defense of Preferentialist Semantics for I Languages. Now the floor is yours, David. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity here. I've enjoyed all the talks. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to make it to all of them. It's the end of the semester at Georgetown and uh, I've got around 90 logic students. So I'm very popular at this uh, point in time. Uh, so like I was saying earlier, uh, I'm gonna be reading here from the paper. I'll try not to make it too uh, painful. There are around 35 slides if you wanna count down to when you're released uh, from your tedium. Uh, the paper is an abbreviated version of uh, a paper extracted from my dissertation, which was uh, defended summer of 2019. Um, uh, there's still going to be something like a defense of referentialist semantics for I languages, but um, I decided that was somewhat uh, misleading a title. So I've retitled it here, uh, Method of Truth and Metaphysics, uh, a Qualified Defense. Okay, so I just want to begin with um, uh, a few epigrams. It is astonishing what language accomplishes. With a few syllables, it expresses a countless number of thoughts. And even for a thought grasped for the first time by a human, it provides a clothing in which it can be recognized by another to whom, to whom it is entirely new. By the way, it, like I said earlier, I tend to speak uh, somewhat quietly. If, if you can't hear me, please just interrupt me and let me know, okay? This would not be possible if we could not distinguish parts in the thought that correspond to parts of the sentence so that the construction of the sentence can be taken to mirror the construction of the thought. The proposition must communicate a new sense with old words. The proposition communicates to us a state of affairs. Therefore, it must be essentially connected with the state of affairs. And the connection is, in fact, that it is its logical picture. I propose to consider whether anything, and if so, what can be inferred from the structure of language as to the structure of the world. So Davidson begins his 1977 essay, The Method of Truth in Metaphysics, as follows. In sharing a language in whatever sense this is required for communication, we share a picture of the world that must, in its large features, be true. It follows that in making manifest the large features of our language, we must make manifest the large features of reality. One way of pursuing metaphysics is, therefore, to study the general structure of our language. So that's a fine statement of the position I want to defend, provided the following qualifications are in place. The sense in which we share a language is that we've coordinated our idiolects. The world in question is in part a world of our construction, our umwelt, our phenomenal world, or Lebensbelt. The extent to which we've coordinated our idiolects is the extent to which we share a world, a certain notional world, to take another locution. The large features of the world which we make manifest and making manifest the large features of our language are so far as they are made manifest features of our manifest image in Sellers' sense, our life, wor life world insofar as we have a reflective grasp of it. So the kind of metaphysics I wish to defend aims to explicate the manifest image. I believe, and here I echo Sellers, that it is a task of first importance to specify this picture or image, given that it is with in this image that we first encounter ourselves as ourselves, or as Sellers puts it, man is what he is because he thinks of himself in terms of this image. I think the method of truth in metaphysics is suited to this task. As Davidson notes, the method has been deployed by philosophers as diverse as Plato, Aristotle, Hume, Kant, Russell, Frege, Wittgenstein, Carnap, Quine, Strawson. It is, in fact, indispensable to the analytic tradition as such. It has the imprimatur of the tradition's founders. Of course, as Davidson adds, these philosophers have not agreed on what the large features of language are or on how they may best be studied and described. 
I will argue that they can best be studied and described broadly along lines suggested by Davidson, augmented and further refined by work in the generative tradition of Chomskyan linguistics. The task of making manifest the large features of our language is, as Davidson states, in many places, an empirical enterprise. In his essay, Truth and Meaning, that paradigm-making paper in which he sets forth his vision for semantics, Davidson writes, the theory of meaning, in my mildly perverse sense, is an empirical theory, and its ambitions is to account, its ambition is to account for the workings of a natural language. The task of a theory of meaning as I conceive it is not to change, improve, or reform a language, but to describe and understand it. Empirical power in such a theory depends on success in recovering the structure of a very complicated ability, the ability to speak and understand a language. We can, as I do, sign on to the idea that the theory of meaning is an empirical theory without accepting Davidson's mildly perverse vision for semantics, namely that it should take the form of a Tarsi-style truth theory. I'll return to that in a proposed alternative below. But does a method of truth in metaphysics not require a truth conditional or referential semantics? It depends, I will argue, on what one means by semantics. The method, in any case, requires only that we be able to say and think largely true thoughts and that there be some empirical enterprise by which we make manifest the large features of our language, to wit, the language in which we think our propositionally articulated thoughts about the world of which these thoughts are largely true. That is, I am hypothesizing, as I believe Davidson assumed, assumed that our idyllics are our languages of thought, or to be more exact, again, our languages of propositionally articulated thought. What's more, I think that at least the majority of the other philosophers whom Davidson includes among the practitioners of the method of, of method, excuse me, the method of truth and metaphysics thought the same. I'll say a bit more about uh, this identification of idiolect and language of thought in a moment, but I want now to say a bit more about the method. So there's a tradition within the tradition of deploying the method of seeking to avoid certain ontological commitments by regimenting natural language into some other more austere canonical idiom, typically a language of first order logic, which eliminates reference to entities not meeting one's metaphysical scruples. So for example, if you think that reports like one are true on occasion, but you're spooked by propositions, creatures of darkness, I think Quine called them, then you might suggest as Quine did, that the logical form of that report is this. With what you might've thought was a self-standing referring expression, referring to the proposition that the earth moves now collapsed along with the verb into a single monadic predicate, predicating of Galileo, the complex property of believing that the earth moves. Spelling it out, we have that, or restoring the order and something of the orthography of surface form, this. Hence the label sometimes applied to the view, semantic fusion view. Davidson criticized the view on the grounds that it does not cohere with the compositional theory of language. But this of course is the form an empirical theory of language must take. The ability we have to speak and understand a language involves creativity or productivity, not to mention systematicity. And the language is importantly learnable. What's more, we can perform a range of logical inferences with the language. None of this is compatible with Quine's proposal, which requires infinitely many prim primitives, one for every sentence of the language, obscures what is common between one and two and blocks elementary inferences, such as the inference from one to the proposition, Galileo said something. Quine's approach gets things backwards. In fact, adopting his approach, approach would trivialize the method. The proper application of the method follows language where it leads. Finding out where it leads is again an empirical enterprise. There's another idea to bring out of Davidson's criticism of Quine's proposal and bringing it out will go some way to explaining my identification of idiolect and language of thought. It was Davidson's idea that one and the same forms should be posited to account for abilities to learn, produce, comprehend, and reason in language. On the one hand, Davidson writes, an account of logical form must lead us to see the semantic character of the sentence, its truth or falsity, as owed to how it is composed by a finite number of applications of some of a finite number of devices that suffice for the language as a whole out of elements drawn from a finite stock, the vocabulary that suffices for the language as a whole. And on the other hand, it should capture inferentially relevant structure. From this point of view, to give the logical form of a sentence is to catalog the features relevant to its place on the logical scene, the features that determine what, sentence, what sentences it is a logical consequence of, 
and what sentences it has as logical consequence. The hypothesis is explicit in Davidson's essay, The Logical Form of Action Sentences, in which he presents, of course, for the first time, his highly influential analysis of what he called action sentences. There, Davidson provides the following programmatic remark. The present essay is devoted to trying to get the logical form of simple sentences about action straight. I would like to give an account of the logical or grammatical role or parts of words of the parts or words of such sentences that is consistent with the entailment relations between such sentences and with what is known of the role of those same parts or words in other non-action sentences. I take this enterprise to be the same as showing how the meanings of action sentences depend on their structure. Clearly, I think these enterprises cannot be the same as Davidson here claims, unless the structure on which the meanings of action sentences depend is the structure that is consistent with the entailment relations between such sentences. I want to take this Davidsonian idea on board while understanding Davidson's, again, mildly perverse conception of meaning to be an optional add-on. More positively, I want to construe Davidson's idea here as the hypothesis, the bold conjecture that the LFs of the generative tradition those forms posited at the level of syntactic description relevant to semantic interpretation and logical form correspond. In fact, I think that with descendants of the forms Davidson provides in that essay, we have intimations of just this correspondence. And here I will uh, skip just a tiny bit since I'm going to assume familiarity with this paper of Davidson's. I mean, the basic idea for my purposes is that there is some support for this correspondence. I don't need to try and argue for that here, I don't think. Okay. Well, if something like this is on the right track, a salutary upshot is that syntactic and logical theorizing should be seen to be mutually constraining, at least among those who adopt a realist view of logical forms. Salutary, I think, because the more constraints on theorizing, the better. It's also an elegant arrangement, and I think just what one would expect if we think propositionally articulated thoughts and so reason in our idiolects. I'll, I'll now say uh, a bit more about that. So the task of uncovering the logical forms of natural language sentences is again an empirical enterprise. Provided we are not anti-realist about the posits of explanatorily successful empirical theories, then the idea is that sentences have forms and the task is to discover them. Specifying these forms is again key to providing a compositional theory of language, which is in turn key to explaining certain manifest cognitive capacities we have, namely the capacities to pr produce, comprehend, and reason in language. The systematicity and productivity of language noted above is indeed, ground, indeed grounds for a sort of empirical transcendental argument. <clears throat> it must be compositional language, provided it is systematic and productive. And though less often recognized, I think the same goes for reasoning in language. The deductive closure of the discrete infinity of sentences we can produce and comprehend comprises infinitely many entailment relations, entailments which within performance limitations we can draw and recognize. This would not be possible if we had to learn each individually. So we must have a capacity to draw and recognize these entailments. That is a capacity to reason logically. We should, I, I think, expect a high level theory of this capacity to take much the same form as seen in cognitive linguistics. Of course, importantly, what we seek to provide in these cases is not a performance model, but a competence model in the sense of Chomsky. As in other empirical disciplines, we must idealize in order to get an explanatory grip on the phenomenon. And the competence performance distinction is introduced to just this end. So I've just provided here a quote where Chomsky introduces this idea. I'll pass over that. Although I would like to, to emphasize his parenthetical remark on the errors, both random and characteristic or characteristic. In seeking to provide competence models, we can thus take in stride all manner of performance errors, of which we make many finite fallible beings that we are. As a competent speaker of a language, you're equipped to judge what is grammatical, meaningful, and valid. It is in fact uncontroversial that your judgments are the primary data for constructing competence models in the case of syntax and semantics. Linguistics and the Chomskyan generative tradition as a branch of psychology. It is more controversial, but I think still correct to say that this is also the case when it comes to logic. One is no more taught how to reason than one is taught one's language. That one might pursue logic as a branch of psychology was in fact, in fact once a common view. It is no longer so in analytic philosophy, at least uh, owing largely to Frege. 
I don't have the space to address all the objections, but one of the main objections to the psychologistic view is that people are pretty lousy at reasoning. But on the whole, actually, we're all quite good. What we pay attention to are the exceptions, and for good reason, they pose problems. The situation is really the same as it, as it is with producing and comprehending sentences. You can produce arguments that people do not understand or which misdirect people and so forth, just as you can produce convoluted sentences that people cannot parse, to take a stock example. And of course, you can produce garbled sentences and flub your reasoning. In fact, there are, as for example, Kahneman and Tversky have documented certain heuristics and biases that systematically short circuit what might otherwise be valid reasoning and the recognition thereof. But recall Chomsky's recognition of random or characteristic errors. This is on the whole, but not always a good thing. So there are exceptions. And of course, there are other limitations, including but not limited to attention span, working in long-term memory and so on, which manifest in all manner of performance errors. But none of this invalidates the, cent the central claim that we have certain competences, which we exhibit daily in reasoning and talking about the world. Again, I think we should expect a high level theory of this capacity to take much the same form as seen in cognitive linguistics. And if we should be realists about the posits of explanatorily successful theories, we should be realists about logical form. I go on to say that unfortunately, Davidson seems to have been a little bit schizophrenic about that, um, unless perhaps he was just an anti-realist about the posits of scientific theories generally. People who know a bit more Davidson than me maybe can uh, inform me on that matter uh, in the Q&A. Um, in some places, he adopts Quine's pragmatic conception, uh, which uh, is like and rightly observes would, would trivialize the, the method of truth and metaphysics, which Davidson uh, adopts. Okay, but how does the foregoing bear on the question whether our idiolects are languages of, languages of thought? Well, again, if we should equally be realists about LF and logical form, and these correspond, it seems to be the most economical hypothesis that our idiolect just is our language of thought. Actually, this is something that I think Peter Ludlow was saying yesterday. Um, uh, in this connection, it might be remembered that Fodor's uh, original offense of the language of thought hypothesis in its 1975 Marshall's processing time data to support the conclusion that the language of thought uh, and the language one speaks are isomorphic. This isomorphism would be nicely explained by their identity. So if the psycholinguistic data still stands up, and maybe people that are more up to date on the psycholinguistics could inform me on that, um, one might well turn this into an argument that uh, our idiolects are languages of thought. One need only reject one of Fodor's main arguments for the language of thought, namely that it's required to learn a natural language. There's of course independent reason for that. It turns essentially on an objectionable view of what learning must be namely hypothesis formation and confirmation of the kind a scientist might explicitly engage in. Compare to this the principles and parameters model of language learning. On this model, learning is closer to growing an organ than forming and confirming hypotheses. Finally, what bearing does identification of idiolect and language of thought have to do with the method of truth in metaphysics? Well, put simply, there would be little point to the method if the things our words were about were not the very things that thoughts we express what these words were about. But it's little wonder practitioners of the method have assumed this connection. But again, whether the method requires a truth conditional referential semantics will depend in part on what one means by semantics. What the method requires is that we be able to say and think largely true thoughts, and that there again be some empirical enterprise by which we make manifest large features of this language. Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead. Read this bit. Okay, so, I, so I've been speaking a language here. I've also been speaking of idiolect. I'll say a bit about what I mean by uh, idiolect here. I think doing so will allow me to thread some more lines of thought from Davidson and Chomsky. Can we move past the Buffalo slide, please? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm done with that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I said it was a minimal PowerPoint. Sorry. I, I should have put some more pictures up here or something. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, so sometimes the language is identified with the infinite set of well-formed grammatical sentences that can be generated with a certain finite lexicon and associated grammar for which we provide a formal specification by providing the rules or procedures for generating the sentences. Other times, languages are grammar, certain biologically, presumably neurally implemented generative procedures, and so study states of the human brain, at least at a certain level of description. On the Chomsky picture, we each have our own language in both of these senses. We speak, as it were, from different languages. That is, we have different, substantially similar grammars, and we each speak a different language, meaning the corpuses of sentences we generate may differ grammatically more or less subtly. 
Most of the time in theorizing, as already noted, we idealize away from the differences. A language in the first sense we call an I language, and a language in the second sense an E language. The I of I language, as I don't need to tell anyone here, is intended to connote intentional internal individual, and the E of E language to connote extensional and external. I let my use of idiolect refer to individual languages in both of these senses of language, laying emphasis on the first contrast between the intentional and the extensional. I don't think there's harm in the looseness there if the difference is just what amounts to uh, a language in intention and a language in extension. And here I'm you know, picking up from Petrosky. Neither is necessarily the same sense of language as used when we say, for example, that English, French, and German are languages. A public language like English is a language in the sense of e-language all members of a language community speak to an approximation. But this is just an abstraction from English, from e languages uh, generated by I languages of members of a language community bound together as such by the members' mutual intelligibility using like sounds and shapes, not to mention various uh, socio-political alliances. When I speak of an idiolect, therefore, you may also understand me as speaking of a public language as an individual speaks it. So I said earlier that the sense in which we share a language is that we've coordinated our idiolects. I also said that the extent to which we've coordinated our idiolects is the extent to which we share a picture of the world. Of course, both ideas are also in Davidson. In his essay, Dialogue and Dialectic, Davidson writes, we are apt to think of natural language as a definite monolithic structure. As each of us learns, to, learns his or her first language, it seems like a given something each person absorbs as best he or she can, something which, if completely mastered, would ensure flawless mutual understanding. It is hard to shake the conception, this conception of language, but of course it must be wrong. Languages were not bestowed on mankind until people talked there were no languages. The ultimate goal in speaking cannot be to get the language right, but to, uh, to be understood. For there is no point to language beyond successful uh, communication. Okay, well, it's uh, with this sort of idea in mind that Davidson remarked uh, to the shock and incredulity of some readers that there's no such thing as a public language, not if a language is anything like what many philosophers and linguists have supposed. What philosophers and linguists, minus perhaps the claim about the point of language, this could have just as well have been written by Chomsky. The view to be rejected is, I think, the one given clear exp uh, expression by Lewis that of a platonic object, a certain monolithic structure to echo Davidson, a set of meaning pronunciation pairs, something like a single common e-language, which if one is to speak with one's fellows, one must learn. Since we share a common species nature and so are operating with the same basic machinery, some aspects of which the empirical enterprise at issue uh, seeks to uh, specify, um, and since we inhabit all assume the same non-notional or numinal world, we can usually work out our differences. Within a language community, by default, we assume that homophonic Davidsonian T sentences provide adequate translations of the speech of our fellows, a translation from idiolect to idiolect. Indeed, from the Chomsky point of view, the, language of the, the languages of the world are but so many dialects of the universal human language. Working with idiolects then and countenancing the possibility of differences in idiolects even within a language community, it follows trivially that there may be differences between different language communities. But the differences themselves are trivial in the sense that incommensurability is no more a worry across language communities than it is within. Our common humanity ensures the possibility of translation. Homo sum, homini, nihil, ami, alienum, puto. In coordinating our idiolects, we're engaged in continual, usually tacit, metalinguistic negotiation. In point of fact, we often query the meanings of words by eliciting judgments on matters of fact. And when we are discussing matters of fact, as Davidson observes, it often happens that what is being discussed is exactly at issue. These are, I think, two sides of the same coin. When things go well, we agree at once on how to speak and what is the case. All discourse, in fact, as Davidson emphasizes, occurs against a backdrop of such agreement, which is something we forge together over time. We are the ones that breathe life into words that make them move. In communication, we work toward agreement as to the use of words or an interpretation of the language, which is at once also an interpretation of the world, which in turn determines how we get on in the world together. Um, right, some, some more uh, some quotes. Here's a, here's a new quote to look at. This one from Wittgenstein, of course. How am I doing on time? Could you just tell me? I, I'm not looking at the chat. Uh... 
something like 15 minutes left. 15, okay, okay. Right, so we've got this uh, remark from Wittgenstein here. So you're saying that human agreement decides what is true and what is false. It's what human beings say that is true and false, and they agree in the language they use. <clears throat> Perhaps in most cases, little hangs on, for example, uh, when exactly green shades into blue, but when it comes to words like virtue, knowledge, freedom, will, person, mind, etc., the situation is different. And perhaps truth and meaning are two more cases in point. It's long been uh, a philosophical task to get clear on words like these and the truths implicated in agreement on their use. As Davidson writes, the Socratic Alinkus, the uh, Socratic method, is a crucible in which some of our most important words and the concepts they express are tested, melted down, reshaped, and given new edge. It's a microcosm of the ongoing process of language formation itself, though a sophisticated and self-conscious uh, microcosm which takes advantage of the rich and complex linguistic and cultural institutions already in existence. But in fact, as Davidson would surely acknowledge, mischaracterizes philosophy more generally. The philosophical activity is part and parcel of the process that creates the manifest image, the reflective image of the world in which we find ourselves. Much of academic philosophy, Sellers said, can be interpreted as an attempt to, by individual thinkers to delineate the manifest image, an image, he adds, which is both imminent in and transcendent of their thinking. This is, again, I think, a task of first importance, and that the method of truth and metaphysics is suited to it. For the world of which we have a picture in this image, I want to say, and maybe here I depart in details from the names I've invoked, is essentially a world as pictured. It is, to echo Wittgenstein, a totality of facts and the intentional objects of which these are composed. The things of this world, things to echo sellers in the broadest possible sense, from cabbages and kings, numbers and duties, possibilities and finger snaps, aesthetic experience and death, are, I think, representation dependent. There is no way the world might be recognition of which does not involve some way of cognizing the world, that is, some way of taking the world to be. That is, if you like, a sort of master argument to allude to Berkeley for the idea that the things that we refer to are representation dependent. Um, well, I was gonna say a bit more about um, Davidson's semantics, but mostly to set it aside. So I'm gonna move to Petrosky now. So Petrosky, of course, is um, uh, someone who has recently come out as uh, one of the great foes of uh, truth conditional uh, semantics. Um, right. So most working semanticists, semanticists think the meanings of linguistic expressions are extensions or intentions. Taking the first line, the meanings of terms, predicates, and indicative sentences are objects, sets of objects, and truth values. Taking the second, the meanings of terms, predicates, indicative sentences are functions from possible worlds of the same. Of course, those can be taken in extension. Often, although not always, as already seen with mention of Davidson, uh, this is combined with the Lewisian view uh, of language rooted above, according to which human languages are sets of meaning pronunciation pairs. But according to Petrosky, this abstraction from psychology has outlived its utility. On Petrosky's view, meanings neither are nor determine extensions. Rather, the meanings of linguistic expressions are composable constructions, the Griff's plans, as he calls them, for accessing and assembling concepts which are mental predicates of a Fedorian language thought. Idiolex, moreover, or slangs to use Petrosky's lingo, are child acquirable, biologically implementable procedures for generating expressions and connecting them with meanings. They are I languages in Chomsky's sense. The view is, as Petrosky says, deeply mentalistic. The meaning of meaning is thus an instruction where this idea is cashed out in terms of the computational theory of mind. This identification is not a matter of stipulation, uh, Petrosky says. So he gives a number of uh, examples, including uh, structural homophony, lexical homophony, and polysemy, just kind of ground his uh, talk of meaning. Some of the examples he gives here. Um, OK. Now, eradicating polysemy and vagueness would leave us with a language in some sense, Petrosky says just as Frege's Begriffschrift is a language in some sense, but it wouldn't be anything like a, a natural language. 
uh, even if we did get rid of these things, we would still be left with other problems, problems like sentence 13 here. If the sentence is truthy valuable, it's true if and only if it's false, that you might think can't be. Still other puzzles arise under the assumption that sentences have truth values. Uh, for example, with action reports here. Uh, so adopting a sort of Davidsonian uh, event semantic analysis, we can nicely account for certain uh, straightforward inferences here, but um, it seems like if you think that events are something like what Quine thought they were, being individuated by spatiotemporal properties, and of course David said to come around to agreeing with Quine like that, then, then you run into strange sorts of uh, consequences. Um, uh, I mean, you might think it follows that Simon can play his tuba on his tuba, for example. Uh, Okay. Um, yeah, I'm conscious of running out of time here. So, so, so I want to present something of a dilemma for uh, Petrosky here. Um, so I'm gonna skip over a bit and, and get to that. I'll show you a picture though. All right, great. You, you, you still have seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay, thank you. Right, so Petrosky offers us the uh, following uh, big picture. Of course, he doesn't uh, deny that we can have uh, true thoughts. I mean, he ought not to do that if he thinks his, his view has a chance of being true. Um, uh, so, and of course, again, for him, meanings are instructions for composing concepts. So we can construct these sentential concepts, uh, uh, which are in a Fedorian uh, language of thought. And he you know, must concede that insofar as they can be true, they have truth conditions. And so that these should be specifiable, at least in principle. Uh, so in light of this sort of uh, recognition, I just wanna reconsider uh, some of the, uh, objections he has uh, to truth conditional semantics. Okay. So there's perhaps no problem of polysemy for the language of thought, provided that polysemy is, as Petrosky puts it, conceptual equivocality. But on the other hand, Petrosky allows for the need to further uh, persistify and supplement concepts even after the relevant concept has been fetched from the relevant family of concepts, as indicated in the diagram here, uh, if you can see where I'm pointing. Um, it would seem open equally to a truth conditional semanticist of natural language to say that the same is true when it comes to meanings. They need only relabel Petrosky's boxes here. The Petroskian view might also suggest a nice solution to the liar paradox. The liar sentence is a loop program with no stopping condition. Though on the other hand, this sort of solution seems equally open to the truth conditional semanticist for natural language. In fact, something like that approach has been pursued by people as diverse as Ryle, Herzberger, Goldstein, and Gonsalves, among others. It's easy to write a program for determining the truth value of a sentence that will run in the loop if you give it the liar sentence. In any case, Petrosky can't think his view is true and solve the liar paradox as he solves it uh, for the uh, natural languages he speaks of. Uh, his solution, of course, is just to deny that they have truth values uh, when it comes to natural language. All right, well, what about vagueness? If predicates have extensions and they are sets, Petrosky observes they must have determinate members and vague predicates don't have determinate members. But then Petrosky must either deny that there are vague con concepts or hold that thoughts comprising vague concepts are without truth values. Provided that most of our ordinary concepts are vague, this leads to a dilemma. Either Petrosky implausibly holds that most of the thoughts we have, including those that make up his book, lack truth values, or he runs into the issue that any solution to the problem of vagueness for the language of thought will likely apply equally to natural language. If he takes the first horn, uh, that strategy seems equally open to any proponent of truth conditional semantics for natural language. You might remember the closing lines of the Tractatus in which uh, Wittgenstein uh, takes a similar line. As for the puzzles concerning event reports, though Petrosky endorses the explanation of acceptable inferences involving event reports in terms of the conjunct reductions uh, permitted by Davidsonian event analyses, he again wants to sever that machinery from the idea that the reports are made true by events. 
So Petrosky's reasoning here is uh, most closely aligned with Chomsky's arguments against truth conditional uh, semantics. Uh, I mean, they're, they're both actually influenced ultimately by the later Wittgenstein. Uh, in that they both make, uh, this is how I want to diagnose it, a crucial assumption that the reference in a truth conditional semantics would have to be description or representation neutral in entities, something like Putnam's or Kripke's natural kinds, or P substances, as uh, Ludlow calls them, as opposed to I substances. Although I think I want to extend that idea to P things and uh, I things. <laughs> um, uh, right. Uh, I've been joining on for a while now. How much time do I have? Uh, two minutes. Huh? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, okay, I'll, tr I'll try and get through this last bit. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's weird. So, so Petros Petrosky, and he's, he's, he's following Chomsky here, I mean, there's a strange sort of scientism as if only the, the language of the scientific image could have uh, reference and, and that this is what's really required if a sort of referential truth conditional uh, semantics is possible. The reason something like this, if referential semantics for natural language is possible, the natural language expressions must, to, to borrow Ludlow's expression again, or extend it anyway, P things for reference. Most natural language expressions don't have P things for reference. Therefore, referential semantics for natural language is not possible. But um, I think we should just reject that first premise. Um, I was gonna say a bit more about the manifest image and try and uh, some, to pull out some deep ponderous final thoughts, uh, playing on some, some remarks from Sellers, um, but Okay, maybe I'll just say this. So Sellers does say in Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, and this, I'll stop after I say this, that in the dimension of describing and explaining the world, science is the measure of all things, of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not. The conditions for the possibility of this phenomenon of describing and explaining, interestingly, is at least partly explained by linguistics in the manner of the genitive tradition, as a wide, I think, the logic taking part in the same framework. Sellers indeed thought that although the scientific image was an outgrowth of the manifest image, and there he was echoing Husserl, the former can explain the genesis of the latter. What I add here is that it is also a science which provides an explanation or explication of the manifest image. That science is metaphysics, a metaphysics placed finally on a foundation as infirm as science. The method could be, in fact, what Husserl in many of his tracks on the method was dimly anticipating. We might call it analytic phenomenology, so long as the enterprise of analysis is understood to be a posteriori and empirical. Metaphysics is not an a priori discipline, unless linguistics is also. As I count linguistics as an a posteriori or empirical enterprise, I count metaphysics as one. I think that empirical linguistics explicates the basic categories of mind, and logic, the laws of understanding. I call the task of explicating these categories and the laws, uh, again, analytic phenomenology. I don't mean that it only provides analyticities. It explicates the structures of the mind, the modes of cognizing, which afford us our human world. I mean, here I have in mind expressions uh, or, or claims from Chomsky actually in response to, to Ludlow 2003 on uh, and there he's quoting Cudworth on constructing our umwelt. I mean, I want to say something very similar, but he seems to miss the fact that there's this third project there. It's either all in the head or it's all out there, but there's this third thing, uh, and you can point to a deep, uh, rich phenomenological tradition where that sort of dichotomy is uh, elided. But, um, well, I'm just going to stop here. Okay, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, David. So we can move on now to the question sections. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, okay, first, uh, John. Oh, hi, yeah. Um, so I'd just like to question the um, accusation of scientism. <laughs> 
Um, so I take, I wish I had the book. Um, I'll just pat you away. But anyway, <clears throat> I think Chomsky's claim, and I'm sure Paul has the same kind of view. It's not so much uh, that the um, putative reference have to be kind of scientifically respectable. <clears throat> it's rather that uh, if you take, uh, and this is what Polysemy appears to show, if you take your kind of common nouns uh, to have some kind of univocal referent, then they turn out to have uh, a cluster of properties which we don't take anything within our, as it were, kind of Lebensvelt to actually have. You know what I mean? I mean to, so it's another way of putting that is to say, look, sure, let there be a Lebensvelt or let there be a manifest image. <clears throat> Truth conditional semantics isn't attuned to that. Do you see what I mean? So, so it's like... Yeah, um, I yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, you know, we don't take there to be abstract objects with mass, right, and so on and so forth, you know. But or we don't take something to be both uh, food stuff and an event, and so on and so forth, right? So, so it's as if um, the. I mean, again, if <clears throat> if truth conditional semantics ignores polysemy or has no story to tell about how polysemy works then it's going to be inconsistent with not only, as it were, physics, but also with um, the um, Leibniz belt or Umbelt. Anyway, that's, yeah. Yes, th th thank you. Thank you, John, for that remark. Um, yeah, I, I think the way I'm understanding Petrosky and Chomsky's reasoning is, again, that a, a truth conditional referential semantics, if feasible, would have to have reference something like Kripke, Putnam, natural kinds. Um, but since our natural language doesn't seem particularly interested on the whole in picking out those entities, um, we just can't have a truth conditional referential semantics for natural language. And I, I, there are, I mean, there, are, there are difficulties about polysemy. I mean, I wasn't, you know, my my tack here was not to address the problems <clears throat> where on so much as it was to try and parry them back to just just erect a dilemma for Petrosky insofar as uh, he accepts that uh, true thoughts are possible. Uh, and that therefore our thoughts have truth conditions, which again, I think should be then in principle specifiable mm -hmm. with a sort of truth conditional semantics, or if we see the word semantics to Petrosky, a truth theory. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say, I, mean, I, I agree that in some places, uh, Chomsky does talk like that. So there's a response to uh, Kirkia where he seems to suggest, look, whatever the reference are supposed to be in a truth conditional semantics ought to be identifiable by a physicist or something. <clears throat> but then elsewhere, certainly in New Horizons, he says, <clears throat> but look, the, 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 the reference you're going to get, if you assume something like univocal reference, if polysemy is um, as we're ignored, and going to even, as we're, be sanctioned in our kind of belief world, you know, because you're going to end up with you know, abstract objects with mass, or you're going to end up with um, locations that have psychological properties and stuff like this, right? You know, what I mean? so it's a, you know, if you just steamroll over polysemy, you're going to end up with this bonkers ontology. But anyway, that's you know. right, right. So, so I think I mean I was trying to say something to address this. So, I mean, I was I was pointing to, I guess you can't see it still, if I can pull it back up real quick. I was pointing to this uh, diagram here and, and trying to highlight in particular uh, Petrosky's recognition of the need for further precisification and supplementation of the concept fetched by executing a meaning. Uh, uh, and I was just thinking, well, you know, uh, why not say that the same is possible also for 
meanings uh, in the sort of uh, s- sort of sense that that you know Davidson might recognize. Um, uh, they just have to relabel Petrovsky's boxes here. Um, anyway, that, I was trying to say something to that effect, but. Again, I think I think I, it's true that you know. I mean, my attitude here is that everyone's got a problem, so no one does. Kind of. Um. <laughs> okay. So I'll I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a satisfactory response to what you have to say, but um, no. I, I mean, I was just picking up on the. Um, it, it, it was just on the kind of scientism kind of issue. I mean, I yeah. I, I do think, and and I think Paul would probably acknowledge this. <clears throat> if you shift. The burden over onto concepts, then you then you start to ask the same issue questions about concepts that you did about meanings. And so I mean, I think that I, I think your charge as we're kind of shifting problems around to, into different boxes doesn't answer the problems, <clears throat> and at least not on the face of it. But um, yeah, I was just I suppose I was just responding to the to the scientism objection. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a, a kind of a response to John, and then I have a question for you. Um, I, the, I mean, I don't the polysemy thing. Let's just set that aside a second and and consider another uh, objection that Chomsky made a lot of hay out of, and that's that's the example of of tea versus water. So, as you recall, the way that goes is. Um, um, somebody uh, puts a bag of tea in your water and brings it to you, that's tea, if, if you're ordering in a restaurant. But if someone dumps a bunch of tea in, in the city water supply and it comes out of your faucet, that isn't tea, it's dirty water, right? So <clears throat> it seems to me that that's, <clears throat> and, and then of course Chomsky's example is the scientism kind of example <clears throat> case where you say, well, but you know, that isn't what referential semantics would give you, right? But this is this is a, a perfect example of if your if your if your referential semantics was hooking you up with life world properties or LW properties, as it were, then the, the, it would precisely nail what's going on in the case of T, right? Um, but this leads me to my question for. Um, oh, you just got muted. My question for David is um, uh, the following. The, uh, there's a, I don't know if you've seen um, Ken Taylor's recent book on reference in the world. Oh, no. um, mm, uh, it, it would be interesting to you. Um, um, not because he takes your position, but he has he has a way of describing a certain position, and I'm wondering if you would identify with this position. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. so you have basically two different views about how reference work. One is you start with the little building blocks of reference, and then you build meanings up from that. And then there's the alternative view, which Taylor calls the jazz combo view of reference, which is the idea that there are a bunch of jazz combo players paying attention to what each other are doing, but they're not looking at notes as it were, right? Now, someone after the fact can annotate this and get a bunch of notes, right? uh, That were actually played, but they are kind of the byproduct of this interaction between different individuals. Um, I guess he lumps Davidson and Sellers and a number of other people into that. So would you identify as a jazz combo theorist in that sense? Um, I'm not entirely sure I've glommed onto the idea, but the, so the jazz combo theorist thinks that there's a lot of reciprocal determination going on, whereas uh, the first type theorist thinks it's a more bottom up uh, picture. Yeah, so, so really it's kind of like a contrast between what you might think early Davidson was saying and what later Davidson was saying. I mean, he sort of complicates the, the picture uh, to be more in line with the jazz combo type picture. But of course, they're compatible looked at from a certain vantage. Again, I'm not being quite sure I've glommed onto the idea. I mean, I think what I want to say at least is that, uh, let me pull back up the diagram again. Um, uh, I think what I want to say at least is that, can you see the diagram? 
yes guess, yeah is that uh the lfs specified here are done and i think this hooks up with what you were saying yesterday yesterday so that the rest is in the enrichment the interpretations that are hung on those uh lfs uh, but they have the basic template which i think is a way of kind of synthesizing early and, and later Davidson. But again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if I, I've misunderstood Taylor's contrast here. Well, I mean, we don't even, let's, we could set aside the issue of the LFs. There's a question of how those LFs are to be interpreted. And then there's going to be, as it were, the, the lexical items or the leaves of the trees have to refer or different, there has to be some referential property there. Which, uh, which you apparently believe that it yeah. hooks up with the world somehow. Yeah. And so then the question is whether, whether we start with little building blocks of reference or whether the reference is a kind of byproduct of, con, a, a, a David's way to put this would be a byproduct of constructing the T theory or the truth theory, or whether mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the byproduct of, of, of this, this of like engaging with other individuals in the world using these logical forms and it's because of that engagement that we that the the reference spills out of that process rather than starting with the reference yeah i mean there's a there's a sort of time scale issue i mean there's a synchronic picture and then there's a diachronic picture. I mean, the latter sounds to me like uh, part of a description of the process of determining uh, reference over time in a language community, a community of, of individuals trying to coordinate on an idiolect. Um, whereas when we take a time slice of the community, I think I'm inclining towards something more like the first picture, but I see them as being compatible in a sort of way. I, I might follow up with you on this just to make and take a look at Taylor just to yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah it's a yeah. good book yeah yeah but thank you thank you okay uh, John you wrote down something in the chat do you want to say something else oh yeah sure did, yeah I don't, I don't want to take up um, uh, David's time if uh, yeah it was just to say um, yeah I kind of agree. With Peter's point there, but I think <clears throat> there is just arguing against a particular, say, uh, view, <clears throat> say the Putnam view that appears to ignore Polisima. So I think Chomsky would think of water <clears throat> as being Polisimus. It has a kind of substance construal where they are interested in something like the essence in scare quotes and also a kind of functional construal. You know, it's the kind of thing you drink, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and these two things can uh, can uh, come apart. But um, so, yeah, it was just that point. Okay, we still have five minutes for more questions to David. <coughs> It, I, I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, uh, I'm not aware of an argument in the literature specifically addressed to Petrosky, which presents to him this sort of dilemma, but I'm finding on occasion that I've got some, some gaps in my, my knowledge of what's going on. Uh, Sorry, do you mean that the, the, no, the line? So, the, the general gist of the dilemma I've presented. Oh, um, oh, what's his name? David David Perpliacek um, has has some some. Uh, uh, and Peter, your remarks yesterday. I mean, obviously, they're going in the same direction. Yeah, the, 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 the Croatian Journal of Philosophy issue, because a, a couple of years ago. Oh right, yeah. In in, in Croatia, Paul. There was a you know a, a meeting on Paul's book, and I think um, Perplia check. Don't ask me to spell it; someone else can. Um, has um, okay. has Paraplotic. Uh, it's Paraplotic. Paraplotic. 
Yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, Georges can spell it for you. But anyway, um, he has. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. He has a paper which um, raises some of these issues. Okay. Or, it, you know, in, in the same ballpark. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so 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 partly, I mean, I've I've got big picture issues in mind here. Uh, I mean, I think the sort of project I want to defend has been gotten at in numerous ways by many people over the years, from you know figures as diverse as Husserl and uh, Dennett, even, and from bacteria to Bach and back. I mean, he's, he talks about. Mm -hmm the manifest, the things of the manifest image or the manifest image supplying the ontology of the Umwelt, which is, you know, composed of the affordances in some extended sense from Gibson. And, yeah. um, so you know, if, if, yeah. if when George wants to insult me and piss me off, <laughs> he, he always says, you, you bloody believe in the Leibniz and the Umwelt. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to, to George's <laughs> talk because, yeah, I think I'm coming at this from a very different sort of a. I, I think though. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm. I'm sorry, yeah. John. I didn't hear what you say. Uh, how I insult you? I, I just didn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me of my insult. Like you, so you always call me Donald Duck. <laughs> Donald Duck, Donald Davis. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. th th I thought issue. that was flattery, but all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The thing mm -hmm. is, I mean, I think if you're there on the tail end of the uh, 18th century, sorry, <laughs> not, um, um, yeah, the 18th century, <clears throat> then Kant yeah. has this brilliant idea, the best idea anyone has ever had, probably. <clears throat> I'm saying, how do we square? The kind of Leibniz realm with 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 the world as uh, being presented to us in the new sciences, but I mean, it, given that we can't go down Kant's route, I don't see any other. Um, you know, it, it seems to me lots of people label the problem, but don't as we try to actually address it, if you like, scientifically. I would say, mm -hmm. well, how on earth is it that we get to construct? A, a life world, which is different from the life world of rabbits. I mean, presumably that's a kind of a, a function of a kind of cognitive capacity. Right, right. So, so that's, I mean, you can, I kind of see what I'm doing is naturalizing Kant in some way. And I'm okay. trying to say that linguistics is actually part of doing that. It gives us the tools to explicate some of what's behind our modes of uh, cognizing to construct the Umwelt. I mean, that's that, that's part of what I'm getting at here. Yeah, um, uh, David, um, have you seen this book by Kaffa? It's called "The Semantic Tradition from Kant to the Vienna." I think it's something like "From Kant to the Vienna Circle" or some such thing. I am. It's I've Kant heard of this Kornet. book. I've not looked Kant into it. Kornet. Kant to Carnet, or the Vienna Station, I think. Yeah, that, I think you'd find that to be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely follow up on that. Okay, thank you. So I, I was just looking for you on my shelf, and I was going to wait for you. Yeah. Did you find okay, it? Um, it must be somewhere. Oh, <laughs> no, I can't find it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, uh, David. Thank you for the questions. So we have now a short break of nine minutes and we will be back. <laughs> 